And now to continue, um, ho hopefully over the next five minutes, I'm just going to talk you through some of the things that we presented to the District Judge, John Woolard, at Chelmsford Magistrates Court, uh, on the a week prior to the court case, um, which might be of some considerable interest to other people out there who may wish to contest the authority of the Crown to judge you in these magistrates courts, these Crown Serving Agents courts. Um, what I mentioned to the judge is that under Article 10 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that I believe that I was not being given the access to what's called a fair and impartial hearing under that Article 10. What I maintained is that because the judge was a serving officer of the Crown, paid for by the Crown, as the Crown Prosecution Service was by definition paid for and uh, a tool of the Crown, um, that the police constable giving evidence against me was a policy officer of the Crown, that this was a loaded tribunal, a kangaroo court, a court of star chamber, if you will. What we had here is the equivalent of three foxes sitting down with a chicken to discuss what's for dinner. There was only one thing on the menu, and it was me. This was um, apparent at all stages by the aggressive nature and the um, refusal to listen by District Judge Woolard when I first appeared before him on the morning of the 29th of August and on the day in question. Now, one thing I was going to challenge at the very beginning, apart from the judicial oath that the judge had taken to the Crown, a copy of which I'd presented to him, one of the things I was maintaining that there was a constitutional aberration in the court because the Bible on which I may have or may not have been asked to swear an oath and any of the officers or any of the witnesses testifying would be asked to swear an oath would have been typically the King James the First Bible which is typically a, uh, a Bible of the Protestant Church or the Church of England if you will or the Anglican Church which maintains itself to be completely separate and um, apart from the Roman Catholic Church, the Papist clergy and uh, the, the, the Church of Rome and the Holy Say in the Vatican. However, what we discovered in the research for the case is that if you actually look at the High Synod of the Church of England's canonical and liturgical uh, doctrines, you'll find in, I think, Canon 15 and 19, one is the bidding prayers and one is for the um, for the, the rights of a, of a bishop to attain office, you will see it specifically states that the Church of England is part of the one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. Right? Now what that in, principally, in principle means is that these what's called four marks under the um, the, the the Treaty of Nicaea at Constant, uh, at Const, uh, Const, excuse me, uh, Const, Constantinople in whenever it was 361, set out these four inviolable marks that de delineate the, the, the Catholic Church. And so what we find is that the, <coughs> the Church of England fully admits that it is part of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. It makes full reference to this. I'd suggest you go and have a look at that for yourself. So what I was contesting on a constitutional point was that the Crown is passing itself off as being antagonistic towards the Holy Roman Empire or the Roman Crown when in fact it's wholly owned. It's a wholly owned subsidiary. It's like Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Exactly the same, branded slightly different with a slightly different taste. And this is one of the things we brought up previous, because on the royal seal and on every seal of the crown of the, the, the royal family, since the time of Henry, VIII, Henry VIII, you'll see a mark on the crown uh, seal, which says Fide Defensor. And that is the defender of the faith title that was originally given to Henry VIII when he was restored back into the church by the Pope. <coughs> Excuse the cough. So that's where we, we got to at that point. The other thing that we were contesting is the fact that my vehicle, my home, 
a private dwelling house cannot be seized under any circumstances as per the guidelines by the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court and also the Road Traffic Act 1988 which forbids <coughs> the police from entering a private dwelling to seize a vehicle or in fact in my case to take my vehicle. Um, these are quite specific uh, fundamental principles of common law. It provides a security for the individual having his tools, his books, his instruments for his vocation or trade or employment, or monies in fact, seized and taken away from him. And this is what the Essex Constabulary in fact did. But more insidious than this, what all of you up there must realise, or out there must realise, is that the legislation states at the moment in what's called the Serious Organised Crime Act of 2005, section 165A and B, this is then enabled or been docked into the Road Traffic Act 1988, sections 165 A and B. How convenient. So, for the police to seize the vehicle as they did, they received that power from what's called SOCA 2005. And SOCA 2005 is this serious organised crime act. And this act was enabled to give the police the right to seize possessions, land, property, money of individuals who are involved in serious organised crime. Money launderers, uh, mafiosa type things, people organised in uh, uh, racketeering. Not for the ordinary individual on the street. And so this enabling legislation we maintain is completely Ill illegitimate because only since 2005 have you been required to immediately produce the documentation. And if you can't produce it at the roadside, they have the right to take and seize your vehicle. I was not involved in serious, organised crime. Therefore, I maintain that this piece of legislation that has been brought in by the Home Secretary, by the Home Office, is illegitimate and it has been forced upon the people covertly in a clandestine manner and it's very, very dangerous and very insidious. Because if you go and look at the policy briefing documents for SOCA, it actually says this SOCA organisation is a corporate organisation responsible through the ACPO, Association Chief of Police Officers, for organising and combating serious organised crime. And if they are maintaining that I was involved in serious organised crime, or any of you out there that know anybody, uh, whether they've seen police camera action or whatever else, that have had their vehicle taken away from them, no matter why, then this is the legislation that they've been organising and uh, seizing these vehicles under. So this is why I think the legislation is, is errant and it needs to be changed. We need to start addressing this and when I get the website uh, in place, what we'd like to do is interested parties who have had their vehicles taken from them and have incurred a penalty or a fine or had to pay insurance costs to re-engage or get their vehicle back, they need to list there and we'll bring a class action lawsuit against the government for illegal seizure. Now, if you were involved in serious organised crime, that's a different matter. We're not there to do anything about that. But for the ordinary rank and file, individual or citizen, maybe there's hope. Thank you. The next one's coming up uh, soon after. Thank you.